this, these, no, these don't go to there. They don't go to there. Do you want me to get a face of time? I'm really good. Good evening, everybody. We're getting ready to start. I'd like to turn the microphone over to Mrs. Cook. Thank you. So good evening. As you know, we're trying out a new schedule this evening. Our general meeting will start at 7, and we're going to enter into our work session now. We used to have our work session at the end of our meeting, and we're trying to move that to the beginning. We're going to see how that works, and we're going to start that this evening. So, Mr. Settle. Thank you, Mrs. Cope. Tonight, uh, our discussion is going to be about the tax rate for 2018. And so, uh, Mrs. Frayne, uh, the first document would be the um, tax rate ceiling document. If you could pull that one up, please. Great. And if you could just scroll to where the highlighted portion is. So every year we uh, get information from the state auditor who has responsibility for monitoring that uh, taxes uh, are, that the tax rates are computed correctly. And so uh, this year, uh, early in July, we received uh, uh, information from the auditor as we always do. And I just highlighted this one section because it does, have an, uh, does play out for us uh, as you'll see a little bit later on. So we make an estimate every year of the revenue that we'll receive from our state assessed properties. And our estimate was uh, $2,560,000 and that was based on uh, receipts from the prior year. So uh, it was our reasonable estimate of what we would receive. Uh, we actually received about $2,443,000. And so that caused the district's 2017, or last year's tax rate, uh, to be recalculated. So the rate that we levied was uh, $4.18.14 and the revised calculation would be $4.18.60. So not a huge difference but uh, a little bit of a change and so that really becomes our starting point for discussions for the tax rate for the 2018 year. So I'm just sharing uh, the information from the auditor uh, as to why that change uh, was made. And so Vicki, if we could now take a look at the AV history document, please. So uh, our assessed valuation does change. It's a constantly moving target. We have some very specific uh, dates that we look at. Specific, uh, uh, and so that March 1st date, the far left column there, uh, that's the information that we had available to us at the time that we uh, created the projected tax liability notice. So the assessor is required to provide that information to us uh, in advance of that early April date when we need to provide information to the county about what our uh, projected tax rate would be. So you can see that we saw a, a very small change uh, in, in real property uh, from uh, December 31st, um, which is essentially the assessed value that would have been in place at the time that tax bills were issued, uh, and, and no change in, in any of the other categories. Uh, then we do have an estimate of new construction uh, at that time, and so the overall change to our assessed value was about 1.7%. And then as we move over to the next column, that's the July 1 number, so that's another a demarcation point, and there was a very slight change from the March numbers to July 1. And then the September 1 number is really our after Board of Equalization hearing. So there are opportunities in state law for uh, taxpayers who believe that they've been assessed incorrectly to contact the assessor and to have a hearing before the Board of Equalization. And then any of those changes that are made are compiled together and we get to see uh, how that affects us. And so that September 1 number reflects the after board of uh, equalization. Uh, those, this will essentially be the numbers that we use to set our tax rate. And so there's a little bit of growth in our personal property, but the other categories remain relatively unchanged. And our, uh, if you take a look at new construction, it's essentially the same, it is the same as the July number, but it's a little bit bigger than the number that we had in April. Uh, when we were making our projected tax liability uh, uh, notice estimate. And so overall, you can see that 
uh, from July, a, a very, very, very small percentage change and just a slightly larger change from uh, March, which is the time that we last had a conversation with the board uh, about our assessed value. Okay, Vicki, if we could take a look at the pro forma. Thank you. So this is a, uh, we, we are required to submit this information to the auditor and they uh, review all of our documentation. Uh, Vicki, we can scroll through that first page. Uh, the next is just a, a summary, and so you can see here line A, that shows our prior year tax rate ceiling, and that reflects the number that has been readjusted as a result of that change in the state assessed uh, uh, revenue. Um, so that is uh, basically our starting point, and you can see then that our, our computed tax rate for this year, that's line B, is uh, just very, very slightly larger than that. So we were at 4.1860, that was our starting point. And when we went through the calculations for this year, it's a non-reassessment year, so other than new construction, there are no real changes to our uh, assessed value uh, of any, that would in any significant way uh, move our tax rate. And so our current year tax rate calculation would be $4.18.62. Uh, we do have a maximum authorized levy of $4.74, so there is opportunity uh, if there were changes in um, our assessed valuation in a negative way uh, that we are able to roll our tax rate up so that we don't lose any money. And so we're very fortunate to have that higher maximum authorized levy. Uh, there was a district in St. Charles County that during the recessionary period as our assessed values were decreasing, they hit their maximum authorized levy and they couldn't roll up even though they had um, a decrease in their assessed value. They were already at their maximum and so they couldn't roll up. So we have that, we have that flexibility. And then uh, finally, Vicki, if we could pull up the last document. This is just a comparison that shows our projected tax rate today uh, compared to what was shared with the board uh, in April uh, for the projected tax liability notice. So, the column that says current, that's the rate that was uh, actually levied. So you can see our, our operating levy there is $4.18.14. That's, and if you think back to the very first document that uh, I showed you tonight, that was uh, what uh, the aud auditor had indicated in their letter. That has since been ejected, uh, uh, adjusted. Our debt service levy is staying exactly the same. We were at 67.13 cents and we're gonna levy that same amount uh, in the current year. So for the projected tax liability notice, we had uh, thought there would be a slight decrease in the rate, and you can see that uh, beca mainly because of the change in that uh, beginning point, uh, we have a very slight uh, change in our tax rate. So our tax rate last year in total was $4.85.27, and for this year, uh, we project it will be $4.85.75, so a tenth of a percent uh, change in our tax rate. And uh, really, that's the information that I have to share. I'd be happy to answer any questions that the board might have. Board, any questions? Kevin, I think you did a great job explaining it. Um, is the Thank you. Um, I just want to thank you for explaining it uh, very thoroughly to us. I do appreciate that. Um, is the process complete now? Help me understand where we at, uh, are at. So once, yeah, yes, once we have the after board of equalization numbers, we really won't have any updated AV. Uh, I am waiting for a final uh, certification from the collector, okay. and that will be what we use, uh, but essentially it matches the uh, information that's in the report for our after board of equalization. So once I have that, uh, we will uh, finalize uh, the documentation. There is a form called the Estimate of Required Local Taxes where we break out our operating rate by uh, fund, so the general fund, the special revenue fund, the capital fund, and then of course our debt service levy. And so in September, we will have a hearing before the board as is required by law for our tax rate. Uh, and, and so that will take place uh, and then essentially I, I think uh, barring any change from the uh, uh, auditor 
uh, and, and these numbers have been vetted by the auditor's office already, so I, I don't expect that there would be. Um, we would be submitting this as the proposed tax rate for uh, 2018. Thank, thank you. Mr. Supple, you mentioned that new construction was different. Can you explain to me, I mean, I don't know, how, why is it different from the regular? I mean, and do we get any revenue from that new construction right away, or how does that work? Yes, we're always able to collect revenue on new construction. So uh, you can think of it this way. Uh, the it's a taxpayer who's completely new to the district. So a new home gets built or a new business is constructed or somebody buys a new piece of uh, personal property, a car, a boat, trailer, whatever it might be. So they haven't paid taxes before, but they will pay uh, taxes on that based on whatever rate that we've set or, and, and, you know, and the other taxing jurisdictions in the county as well. Okay. And so yes, we do recognize revenue as a result of new construction. Is it a lot more? Is, I mean, is it a lot? Is it about the same or every year? Or? Uh, our new construction number this year is about $22 million, so that's better than it has been. But I will tell you that prior to the recession, it was not unusual for us to have 35 or $40 million of new construction in a year. Okay. So uh, we are we're growing. It, 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 during the, the lower point of the recession, about 2009 or 10, okay. our new construction was down around $12 million. Okay. So it's come up uh, substantially, uh, and uh, it's con somewhat consistent. Our, our new construction number last year was uh, in basically the same range. So as long as we continue to have that level of growth, I think that's a, a positive thing. Okay, thank you. So I, I do have a question. So the um, New construction doesn't that lower the tax base for or spread it out more for everybody else? It does not. Uh, the it it broadens our tax base, so uh, it its effect is felt perhaps more uh, dramatically in a reassessment year because. Well, we're able to capture revenue on new construction because the total assessed value is that much greater. It does broaden the tax base, which helps to drive down the rate that's necessary for other taxpayers. So, yes, new construction is a positive thing because we get revenue from it, but it's also positive because as we grow our tax base, the rate that we have to charge to collect the same amount of revenue can be lowered because we have a broader tax base, a larger assessed value against which we're uh, levying that tax. Okay. Board, any other questions? All right. Thank you very much, Mr. Supple. My pleasure. Thank you. So our regular meeting will start at. Thank you. Our general meeting will start at 7 p.m. So we'll take a recess till 7.
So this evening, we will start with the Pledge of Allegiance that will be led by St. Charles County Ambulance District. If you could join us at the podium. District Outreach Association is a nonprofit organization formed to increase awareness of the St. Charles County Ambulance District's presence in the community and provide opportunities for citizens to participate in meaningful education programs such as Lifesaver CPR and Lifesaver AED. A major goal of St. Charles County Ambulance District Outreach is to make St. Charles County the safest community in the nation. This donated AED was purchased with a grant from the Boeing Employees Fund. Francis Howell was selected to receive this donation because we're a strong community partner and having the AED located in one of our facilities allows for a safety net for a large number of people. So more bang for the donated buck and more of our employees within reach of a life-saving AED. Uh, Chief Daz Meyer is here. Chief, would you like to say a few things? Thank you. Uh, I'll just take a minute. Uh, one of the Basically, uh, thank everyone for having us here. We're very happy to be able to donate this uh, AED to the school district. Uh, you know, unfortunately, several hundred thousand people die every year due to cardiac arrest outside the hospital. And uh, what those folks need are CPR and have a, an AED nearby. And uh, that has been the goal of Lifesaver CPR. The folks here, I'd like to introduce real quick. Chad Metz, uh, you just heard, uh, Assistant Chief Kelly Cope, uh, Dave Kroll, and Derek Vandering. These folks are all very active in our outreach program. And uh, Lifesaver CPR has been teaching CPR for the last several years. You probably heard about it. We try to make sure everyone heard about it. And has actually taught a few thousand people CPR in the last few years. However, uh, in addition to the CPR, you need the AED. And so we're trying to spread that word uh, get AEDs further out into the field, and uh, by adding this one to your to your cache of AEDs, we hope to support your efforts. Uh, it's our hope to support your efforts to be prepared if the need arises. So thank you very much. North Senior, Alea Autumn, really wants to work with her hands after high school, but it was her speech about Skills USA that has made her a national champion. 
This summer, Alea was one of six Lewis and Clark Career Center students to travel to Louisville, Kentucky for the 54th Annual Skills USA National Leadership and Skills Conference. The event is the world's largest showcase of skill trades and skill competitions, and after several grueling days of competition, Alea placed first in the speech competition. Alea, would you please come on up here? about the skills organization that was at least five to seven minutes long, memorized the entire thing, and then present it to three judges and a timekeeper. Her speech was about how Skills USA helps students with both technical and personal skills, goals that align closely with our new strategic plan. But rather than have me tell you about it, we thought you might like to hear a little of it from Olaya. I'll just start off with the beginning. Um, the great Malcolm X once taught us, the future belongs to those who prepare for it today. This quote expresses the point that preparation, including management, organization, and planning, is key to a brighter future. Preparation is essential if we want to achieve our goals, especially goals related to the workforce. In my perspective, this quote has a powerful impact among young people who are not only eager to learn, but committed to progressing skills needed for their careers. But how can we prepare today to be successful in the future? Skills USA uses a framework that includes workplace, technical, and personal skills, all necessary to succeed. This framework trains Skills USA members for the real world and helps them become job ready on day one. That's the beginning. <laughs> Tony, you want to come up and get the picture? Not take the picture. We'll take the picture for you if you want to get in it. <laughs> Alea is a senior and will be finishing up the building trades program at Lewis and Clark this year. She already has a job as a carpenter lined up after graduation. President Cope and Board of Education, Dr. Hendricks Harris, and the Executive Cabinet. We are disappointed in the Board's decision to turn their backs on their teachers. We have all we have heard all of the excuses. Stop blaming FHEA. FHEA did not walk away from the table. The Board gave a final offer of one step. We said we didn't believe our teachers would ratify that offer. And apparently you had a difficult time agreeing to a step according to some of your Facebook posts and conversations that you have had with several teachers. One struggle the Board of Education Administration has is public trust. We have had three failed levies because the public doesn't trust you, and now neither do your teachers. Trust needs to be built. You have the ability to invite us back to, um, into a partnership. Show your teachers that you respect them and go back to the table.
Good evening, President Cope, board members, Dr. Mary Hendricks Harris, and the cabinet. VSPA does appreciate the support of the students with behavioral and emotional concerns by having an educational support counselor in each building. We are also appreciative the board desires our opinion. The behavior support specialist position was presented to us last week and we've asked Human Resources some questions which they have answered for us. While we support this position being a part of VSPA, we do still have a few concerns. With the creation of these new positions that pay more, we are concerned SPED Paris will then want these positions. There already seems to be some difficulty in filling or keeping para positions filled for our SPED students. And these positions may leave us with an even larger shortage of SPED paras. There are currently five posted openings for SPED paras. Some of these paras are already working with students with behavioral or emotional concerns. Will they no longer be working with these students since the behavior support specialist is working with them and being paid more? If the SPED paras will still be working with these students, shouldn't their pay also increase? What will the extra qualifications be for these positions since the pay is higher? The second concern is with the lead behavior support specialist position. Why is there a need for this position? Wouldn't the behavior support specialist just take direction from the educational support counselor? Just as all SPED pairs take direction from the SPED teacher they work with. Our understanding is the lead will be training and supporting the behavior support specialist as part of the lead's job description. Shouldn't that require greater or higher qualifications? Another thing to think about is if a SPED pair's absence is unfilled, would the behavior support specialist be pulled to help SPED? In reverse, if the behavior support specialist absence is unfilled, will a SPED para be pulled? Again, we appreciate the additional support for students, but how will this look to the public? We asked for a tax increase, which the voters turned down, and now we want to add positions. How can that be afforded if we didn't get the tax increase, and what perception does this give the public? If this can be afforded, couldn't teachers at the top of the pay scale also receive a stipend? Amen. Thank you for your time. tonight and just share a little bit of information uh, about our food service program in general. Uh, so uh, we do operate a, a, a well-run program and my thanks to uh, Carl Ventimiglia who is our on-site manager and, and Karen Mann. I think uh, they're both here this evening. They were going to be here this evening, so I, I do want to thank them. Uh, so we do run a, a surplus of revenue over expense in our food service program. And so what are the reasons for that? Well, our vendor rebates have been increasing. Uh, you can see some of the figures there. Uh, we've also seen an increase in our meal participation rate. Uh, the significant increase in breakfast is really because we've expanded that to all of our school sites. Uh, but even in our lunch program, we've seen in the last five years a 7% increase in our participation rates. And we've been able to decrease our food costs because we're uh, making better use of commodity foods and we're doing more from scratch cooking, so we aren't paying uh, sometimes an inflated price for pre-prepared uh, products. Carl and Karen, thank you. <laughs> Uh, so we currently have a balance in our food service fund of about $1.2 million. Uh, because of the way that the federal school lunch program is structured, uh, those revenues all have to be used in service of the food service program. 
Uh, and so we've been trying to make strategic use of that. We do, uh, have been investing in updating our kitchen equipment, and uh, we've purchased some new cafeteria tables. Uh, at some of our levels, we actually, the, the food service program actually supports uh, the cafeteria aids. So we've been taking the funds that are generated by that program and reinvesting them uh, in making our program even stronger and making sure that we have the equipment necessary uh, to function correctly. Uh, I would just uh, share with you, you know, one of the highlights of our program is our Iron Chef. The board, of course, has had an opportunity to participate that, in that uh, fine event for a number of years. Uh, we were able to bring people in uh, from outside to help us with that. You know, uh, chefs from uh, uh, Van Buskirk uh, was there and, and uh, Carl uh, McConnell from Stone Soup Cottage uh, lending their expertise to kids. And last year, our theme, not uh, uh, accidentally, was food truck food. And the kids were all uh, uh, encouraged to design menus uh, that would be uh, cooked and served from a real food truck. And so these are just some pictures of the great opportunity for those kids to participate uh, in a real learning, a real life uh, learning event uh, and, and preparing themselves for a competition. And so the last, last year's winning menu from Francis Howell North, you can see the uh, items up there. Uh, we had a great time in enjoying the delicious food, and, and it was uh, just a, a tremendous uh, amount of fun and a great learning experience for the kids. Uh, so we do have a fantastic partnership with Sodexo, and as part of the contract that we have with them, uh, they agreed to invest a certain amount of money in capital improvements for the district. Uh, because our program has been able to make some of the necessary improvements in terms of stoves and refrigerators and tables uh, based on the, the revenue that we generated, uh, we thought very creatively about how we could uh, make use of those funds from Sodexo. And that's what we use to purchase our food truck. And so uh, we're going to be introducing this year to our community uh, food for thought. And you can see there it's chef-led and student-made. Uh, and so here's a picture of what the truck looks like. And Vicki, we can take a look at the other side of that. Uh, and we'll get to this a little bit later, but the, much of the design was actually done by a student from Francis Howell North. So uh, congratulations to her teacher and, and, and to Jenna Pei uh, for that excellent uh, job. It's just, it's just really beautiful. So we know that the district's strategic plan that we're getting ready to really begin to implement has a very strong focus on college and career success. And as I'm looking at our vision statement, and uh, you might have noticed that we've updated our walls to reflect our new strategic plan, uh, our vision includes providing authentic and engaging real world learning experiences. And that's exactly what we're going to be able to do with our food truck. And so we know that our culinary arts program has for years had a career readiness focus. Uh, through our partnership with Sodexo, they've awarded $180,000 in scholarships to our students. And our students have pursued uh, degrees and careers in the culinary arts field. Uh, we believe we have somewhere between 15 and 20 graduates working in the culinary field. And uh, they're doing some pretty fantastic things, like working for uh, Chef McConnell at Stone Soup Cottage, rated again as the top restaurant in the St. Louis area. And I uh, even know of a student who's working uh, for Wolfgang Puck. So, our schools have prepared kids to do some fantastic things. We also know that nationally, uh, there is a shortage of well-trained chefs. So this is just a snippet of an article from the New York Times from April. Uh, restaurants are having to get a little bit more creative. This particular story talks about how a restaurant is having their own training program because they can't find people who are already trained. So they're bringing them in and training them themselves. Um, again, another restaurant uh, with a culinary training program uh, to try to address that critical need. And then we know that there's legislation now uh, in the state and also at the federal level uh, that we're going to have to address critical shortages in our working population. So Desi is going to be telling us what are those career fields where there are critical shortages. Uh, we also have a career readiness uh, task force and they're going to be taking a look at how we can push career readiness even to the middle school level. So there's a strong emphasis, not only through our strategic plan, but at both the state and federal level on uh, career readiness. So how is this food truck 
uh, going to uh, mesh into that? Well, it's a complete restaurant on wheels. And so uh, kids are going to have an opportunity to have that authentic and engaging real world learning experience. Uh, so the, tra the, the truck will be staffed by Sodexo personnel, uh, but we will invite our culinary arts students to work alongside them uh, as that fits into their schedule and so forth. And so what are some of the skills that, that they're going to have to master? You can see them there, you know, interacting with cust customers, being able to manage a point of sale system, learning how to cook a wide uh, variety of cuisines, all of those uh, restaurant skills, food prep and sanitation, and some of the daily operations, planning out the schedule so that you can get things done in time, uh, being able to calculate food costs, creating a business plan, uh, developing menus and marketing the product. These are all things that are going to translate into very marketable skills as, as kids go on from Francis Howe. And so there we have another shot uh, of the uh, truck. And again, thanks to Jenna Pei and uh, to Courtney Flam, the teacher of Francis Howe North, who I'm sure uh, guided her along the way. But uh, we're very excited that not only the, the learning experiences that kids have, but even kids not involved in the culinary program are able to demonstrate their career readiness by preparing something for a commercial product like our food truck. So how, how are we going to use it here in Francis Howe? We are actually going to tour to our uh, schools and it will be available at lunchtime. Uh, the meal that will be uh, served from the truck will be designed so that it will meet our federal nutritional requirements. So all of our kids, even kids on free and reduced lunch, uh, will be able to participate. They'll, they'll, they'll use their lunch account just like they would in the cafeteria. Now, I want to be uh, clear, we're not going to be able to go, let's say, to Fairmount and feed a thousand kids. That's not going to happen. Uh, but we'll probably work with the principal to find a lunch period or some <coughs> classes that would be appropriate. And in addition to giving kids the opportunity to come out and experience lunch from the food truck, will be using it as a teaching tool at the same time. So how can you, uh, what really makes up a healthful meal? Uh, we always provide those within our cafeterias, uh, but kids never probably stop to think about it because the choices are already right there in front of them. Uh, but going up and ordering off a menu like you would at a food truck will help you have an opportunity to think differently <coughs> about how you order. And particularly when you're eating out, so again, when you're in the cafeteria, the choices are all good choices that are in front of you. But if you're going out to eat, maybe we can help provide some instruction so kids can develop some very helpful habits that will last them throughout their lifetime. So we're very uh, excited about that. Uh, we also think that this would be a great opportunity for us to be partners in the community. Our boosters clubs or our PTOs uh, may be interested in using the truck to supplement uh, an event that they have going on. Uh, we already have a request for uh, the truck to be used in an upcoming weekend for an event that's taking place at one of our schools. Uh, uh, our clubs or alumni foundation may be able to use that. Uh, and then there will be some food truck days uh, in the community where we would be able to have our <coughs> presence there and it gets our name out in the community. And we'll be able to share the great work that we're doing in terms of helping our kids be ready for college and career. And so I'm very excited about this great opportunity for our kids. It's such a nice tie-in uh, to the work of our strategic plan. It matches so closely with the things we're trying to do in goal one. And I think that we will have uh, a, uh, a, a program here uh, that will be an envy of people uh, around the area. I've already had a contact from another school district who read some of the press releases. They're very anxious to come and uh, see it in operation. They're making a case to their Board of Education to do something similar. I'd be happy to answer questions. Thank you, Mr. Supple. Board, any questions? Mr. Hank? Yeah, I just want to clarify for everybody that no taxpayer dollars were used to purchase this truck. That's just correct, Mr. That, that's correct. Plain and simple for everybody. Yeah. And then the other thing is they did have the food truck out there this evening and we did have an opportunity to go inside of it and it is not your typical food truck. It is stainless, it's got state-of-the-art everything in it, it's not your converted bus and a lot of those types of things that I wouldn't want to eat out of this place is <laughs> unbelievably up-to-date and you know, kudos to Sodexo for not only providing the food truck but doing it right. So thank you. Yeah, I agree. We did get the opportunity to see and tour the food truck this evening. Uh, it was 
what's beyond my wildest dreams. It is just amazing, and I'm so excited about this program. And we were very uh, uh, deliberate in the way the truck was designed, so that it's, you know, sometimes trucks have a singular focus. You know, a taco truck, and they're making Mexican food, or a cupcake truck, and they're making cupcakes. Uh, this is a very flexible space so that children have an opportunity to be creative in their menu designs and it can be accommodated within the trunk. So we're not limited to a single cuisine. Kids really have a chance to explore the creative side of menu design and we'll be able to, to use that. So uh, again, thanks to uh, Carl and Karen. Uh, a lot of their uh, blood, sweat, and tears went into the planning of that and the realization is, is truly amazing. Thank you. Gordon, any other questions or comments? Thank you very much. You're welcome. Next on our agenda under academic high target is our student data review for 2017-18. Mr. Hoban, Dr. Hoban, excuse me, it's the first time I get to introduce you. I apologize. No problem at all. Well, thank you. As we get ready to do a, a preliminary update tonight, one of the problems we have is some of our data is complete from last year, others they're still not. So we'll talk about the things we do know and the things that will still be yet to come and, and do what we can to give you a summary there. So first up, as we talk about uh, the timeline that's ahead of us, APR is not going to be available till December this year, so some of those things are going to have to wait. Likewise, um, the workshop we'll do with the board, map data, all of that's going to have to wait until December, unfortunately. So um, those things are on hold right now for a little while. Other timelines, you've seen this in the past. This is just uh, the most recently updated version of this. This refers to the different standards uh, that the testing is based on. So that in green, still based on old standards um, last year and still this year for social studies, uh, but moving into next year, we are moving into new standards for all of our different tests. The graduate follow-up, 180 days after graduation, you can see here a lot, lot of information in this chart. The, the one thing we tend to focus on, looking at those top two lines, right at just under 80% of our students are going to a four-year or a two-year college. So, so we're still a district that very many of our kids are attending college uh, in some fashion. And those numbers have been relatively stable, high 40% for the four-year college and uh, low to mid 30% for two-year colleges. You can see the rest of it as we go on down the chart. Moving on to our graduation rate. This is um, a, a point of celebration for the year, which later on we'll talk a little bit about what our what our high points are for the year, but you can see uh, a very good trend in our graduation rate here. We've 96.4% is it's the high that we've got here, and uh, fantastic numbers when we're looking at graduation rate. Now to get into some of the data that we do have at this point, uh, David Brothers spends a lot of time analyzing and, and looking through these numbers and, and putting together an analysis of it, and I think it would be a shame if we didn't invite him to spend a little time talking about some of this data that he worked so hard on. So first, really a success story here in Francis Howe is our, grad, our, uh, our graduates accessing advanced placement courses. True testament to our buildings in encouraging and opening access to those courses because we know um, if a student takes an advanced placement course, they are much more likely to be successful in college. What I'd like to see, you can see 54.2% of our graduates are at accessing advanced placement courses. Um, Dr. Hogan just a minute ago referenced the 80% going to a two-year or four-year college. I'd like to see that number keep increasing so that we get that 80% there in the um, accessing AP courses. Um, if you look, the, um, this chart represents our AP enrollment across time. The green bar, that, that represents the number of students taking one AP course. And if you look from 1718 to 1819, that number has increased by about 150 students. That's incredible. Um, the yellow bar there represents um, students accessing more than one course, one, more than one AP course, and we've seen increases in that. And that orange bar, that represents our total AP enrollment. And so if you notice that 900 number and that 800 number, they, they don't make that 3,000 number, and that's because we have a good number of students taking two, three, four, five AP courses. So lots of our students are taking very highly rigorous coursework. Um, and, and our measure, how do, how do our students doing on that? Um, they, at the end of the course, students can choose to take an advanced placement exam, and upon completion of that exam, if they earn a score of three, four, or five, many colleges and universities will earn advanced placement credit, or um, advanced college credit for that. And as you can see, we have 
again, more and more students taking those exams, and here in a second you're going to see what kind of the amazing trend is. Typically, as you have increased um, access to these courses, and more and more students are taking the courses, you would anticipate a dip in the students passing the courses. And as you can see, um, we've been very steady, and we've actually increased the percent of students passing those courses. So our, our high schools have done just a great and phenomenal job, not only getting students and identifying students that we think would be potentially successful in those courses, but providing um, support for those um, students as they get into those programs through like our AP Foundations course that we implemented last school year. Next slide represents our junior ACT data. For the last four springs, Francis Howell has given all of our junior students an ACT test. And if you look at the bright point here is our ACT composite score is up 0.5 from the 16-17 the school year. And a 0.5 increase, that, that is a, a pretty significantly statistic gain. Um, as you look at the different subgroups, we are up in the areas of English, reading, and science. We had a small decline in, in math by 0.1. Those red um, horizontal bars there, those represent the college readiness benchmarks as defined by ACT. And what it represents is if the students are meeting those benchmarks, they have a 50% chance of earning a C or better in the entry level, college level course, or a 75% or better chance of getting a, a, a set, I'll take that back, 75% chance of earning a C in the course, and a 50% chance of getting a B or higher in the course. And we have students meeting those benchmarks in English and in reading, and we're close to the mark in mathematics and science. Last measure I'm going to go through is our district reading data. Um, the district gives the Gates McGinley um, reading test to measure and figure out the number of students that are reading at or above grade level. And from 16, 17, and 17, 18, we did experience a decline in about 2.5%. Um, it, it's a data point we have our eyes on, and we'll be looking at different um, data points and trying to figure out the reason why. As we look a little bit more deeper into the reading data, um, the bars on the top, what those represent is comparing third grade to fourth grade to fifth grade. Ideally, we would see our third grade scores <coughs> be wherever they're at, and then we'd want a little bit higher in fourth grade, a little bit higher in fifth grade still, representing that the longer the students are with us, that they are reading, we're getting more and more of those students to read at or above grade level. The chart below, that's some cohort data. So if you were to follow the light blue um, highlighted cells there, see in 15-16, we had third graders at 72.5%. In 16-17, that bumped up to 80% when they were fourth graders. And that same group of kiddos when they were in fifth grade, it did decrease to 75.5%. 70 if you look at our cohort data, it's inconsistent. So we have some cohorts of students that are doing better from 16-17 to 17-18, but we have some other grade levels that it's a concern that they did it decline. Our middle school reading data it is very similar to our elementary data. It's inconsistent. Um, again, we'd like to see the bars at the top continue to increase across time. And again, with the cohort data, we'd like to see as time moves forward, that same group of kids, we are getting more and more of them reading at grade level or above. And I think that I'll turn that back right. over to Dr. Hogan. All right, next slide we're going to talk about, and we will come back at the end and, and focus a little bit on where we see areas for improvement and, and what we're going to celebrate as well. So when we look at our attendance rate, uh, similar to what we just talked about with reading, we have seen a dip in the last couple of years. So uh, certainly this is something that, that is on our radar to talk about. All of our buildings are interested in what they can do in their buildings to impact this. Every year you can talk about what kinds of things do we think might have impacted this. Uh, last year, solar eclipse day was, was not a great attendance day, things like that. Sometimes you have an outbreak of the flu, you have some things like that. Um, any given year, that can impact that. We, we certainly don't want to look at that and say that explains away any, anything that we have going on. We certainly want to continue to focus on what we can do to impact that. Um, and this number, 1% uh, is really going to work out, to, depending on the size of the building, probably 5 to 10 students in any given building. Um, who would have met the 90% attendance a year ago who didn't meet it this past year. So it's not huge <coughs> numbers of kids that we're talking about, but you can see the impact it has on the district certainly is something we need to be aware of and we need to be focusing on. The next issue that we do keep our eye on is, is what we would start to call chronic absences. 10 plus absences 
you really need to miss about 17 days in order to be on that border of 90% attendance. So many of these students still counted within that 90% rate. However, you start missing 10 plus days, you start talking about once a month or more, and, and it can quickly add up after that. So you can see that at every level, that's about a 6% increase over the last um, four years. And so that is something we want to keep an eye on as well. And so as, as we get into the strategies, our buildings are certainly going to be working on what they can do to impact these numbers. So next thing is to talk about is our uh, discipline stats. If, if you look, the, the green bar is our ISS, and you can see that there's a pretty good trend over the course of time that we're seeing a decrease in our ISS numbers. The OSS is the orange bars. Those have been relatively steady. So if you go all the way back to 13, 14, you can see a significant decrease since that time with, with a slightly smaller decrease just in the last couple of years. So we get into the things uh, from the presentation tonight that we're, that we're celebrating. One is the graduation rate again. 96.4 uh, was an extremely high graduation rate. We're very proud of that. AP access to those courses has been not only the, in, the huge increase in kids taking these courses, but as David pointed out, there, our percentage of kids passing is going up. And to both increase your access to that course and the performance on those exams is, is something absolutely to celebrate. Testament to all the teachers out there who, as David said, are supporting those kids. We're challenging more and more kids in that coursework and helping them get through that successfully. Uh, so our AP scores uh, as well. Um, junior ACT data, you know, as David mentioned, going up a half point in one year in a composite is, is a huge jump when you're talking about ACT scores. Um, along those lines, we, we are keeping track of the college readiness as well. And then with the discipline, wasn't a huge decrease, but we are trending in the right direction, and, and so we do want to celebrate those decreases in discipline events. Then we move into our opportunities for improvement. So attendance, as we just got done talking about, um, you know, you don't like to see a trend heading downward. So that's something we're certainly going to be focusing on as we meet with all of our buildings and, and we look at their school improvement plans. Um, very much, they're they're focused on what they can do to impact attendance on a building by building uh, level. Reading, David mentioned a few things. There, there's there was a change in the format of, of the reading assessment. We also changed from giving it in the spring to giving it in the fall. So there are potentially some logistics that might have impacted our reading to some extent, um, but certainly we're going to look deeper than that and see what we can do to impact those reading scores. Uh, suspension rates, we while they did not increase, we're still looking at that. We'd like to see those numbers continue to decrease, so we're going to focus on that as well. And then, as I mentioned, the ACT college readiness. Um, you know, meeting in two areas, not quite meeting in the other two. Um, if, if we're going to be sending 80% of our students on to college, we want to do our best to make sure that 80% of those that those students are ready when they get there and, and prepared to be successful when they get there. So, uh, those are things we need to look at. So, along those lines, some of the strategies, and it's it's impossible to talk about all of the different strategies just tonight in one presentation, because so many of these strategies will get tailored at the building level uh, for the specific kids in those buildings. Um, but certainly examining our reading achievement. How do we assess that? Are we, a, are we getting accurate information? Is the test we're using and the timing of it and all of that still doing what it needs to for us? Um, the second bullet here really will flow through all of this. The continued focus on social and emotional supports for students, that's going to help impact attendance, help in, impact their academics. And so really overall, um, whether we're doing that through the staffing we've talked about, doing that through strategies at the building, that's certainly uh, something we're focusing on. Students with chronic absenteeism, again, that certainly directly affects the absence data, but when you start talking about achievement data, absenteeism certainly uh, plays a huge role in that as well. So buildings are very much taking an individual focus on attendance and identifying specific kids and what they can do to work with them. Staff knowledge of restorative practices, PBIS, trauma, sanctuary, equity, these are all focuses that in, in different buildings might look a little different, but all around taking care of the whole child and making sure that all of the students in our schools um, are able to perform to the best levels they can. Specifically looking at math, implementing um, college prep math and, and you know looking at more real world hands-on types of applications in our math courses, which when we look back at our junior ACT data and that college readiness, you know, we hope would impact that as well. And this summer had a lot of teachers trained on uh, writing workshop and looking at our ELA curriculum, those are things that we do believe we have positive impacts moving forward as well. So let's quick run through any questions that David or I can answer for you. 
Thank you very much. Very thorough presentation. Or do you have any questions about the meeting? Just clarifying, out of school suspensions do affect attendance. Yes. Yes. Thank you. That's tough. That's because you have to do it, but at the same time, it does affect the attendance. I have a couple questions. Um, we introduced last year the intro to the AP class. The AP class. Foundations class? I'm sorry, what is the title? The Foundations of AP. Yes, thank you. How do you feel that's affecting our enrollment this year? Are we going to see a continued trend? I think we're going to see a continued trend of increasing access to AP. Um, that Foundations class really has help students take the first students that not, not normally would have historically taken an AP course are able to get in that course, learn some college note taking skills, um, work with a counselor on time management and stress uh, management skills, um, and, and then just working with an AP teacher on how to get through things, how, how to study for a college level course. And so with that, they're experiencing success, and you, you, you saw the data, they're experiencing success at um, better than we would expect for the number of students that we've increased. And so that, that is part due to, not all of our students take the AP Foundation course, but that's definitely a, a success. And then uh, we offer a three day, three or four day um, summer AP camp as well, just to get students introduced to the, some of those same things. Good things that I think are, are, are helping those rates. Um, and not, I apologize for putting you on the spot, but a curiosity nugget came at me during the presentation. How do our ACT scores compare to other districts? Do, do you have the data? We don't have, that's our junior ACT data. Mm -hmm. um, in about a month, we will receive our graduate data, and then Desi will make public the, the different districts' data. Um, typically, we are running uh, to St. Charles County. We, we're typically at the top of St. Charles County. A um, little bit behind, or at a point behind Rockwood Parkway, I would say, typically. We'll see how things turn out this year. Great, thank you. Um, we saw great, I mean, great trends in data with the junior ACT data. Right, that, that looks um, very solid. I just want to point out a couple things in regards to two of your questions. One had to do with um, the ACT. I think as we shift to the new strategic plan, we will focus more on those college and career benchmarks versus getting our composite higher. So what we want is more students in our district who graduate and take the ACT to be hitting those benchmarks that are good predictors of whether a child's going to be successful in college. So it's a great indicator, maybe. Um, so if you think about the average complete <coughs> score of our seniors, you have some that are scoring, you know, we celebrate them every year as perfect scores. And then you have others who um, make, that, make that average a little lower. And really what we want to focus on is getting a percentage of kids at those college per benchmarks, which we are not meeting in some areas. And so that's going to be a shift in thinking uh, regarding ACT moving forward. And then the other thing I just wanted in regarding your AP question, I think some of the supports we put in place are because we're shifting our thinking from you know, we want to have a lot of exams written and a lot of classes taken to we think it's important for kids to experience AP. So whether you are going to be reading and writing at that rigorous level for a career or reading and writing for college, we want, as David said, our graduate number, our, our percent of graduates to match that AP number. So um, we're, we think we, based on some strategic planning, but we have some kids who are under a lot of stress because they are taking a lot of AP courses and that's not necessarily beneficial to them. But we would like to focus on getting some kids who are not taking any AP courses interested in some areas and focused in a passion and able to take that course. So it's kind of a shift in thinking in AP. And if their goal is college, that they're <coughs> having that experience have ready for yeah. to help with that decision. Great. Thank you. Board, any other questions? Ms. Walker. I'm just curious about how many AP classes do we have and are they fairly equally distributed between the three schools? <laughs> The number off the top of my head, it, it would be probably about 25 different AP courses. Um, and it, we have strong, like our uh, higher numbers in calculus, biology, chemistry, English language, uh, American, gover American government. Those are some of our higher um, number of students taking those courses. Um, and then we have pockets of smaller ones across maybe our art history, art studio, music theory, uh, microeconomics, macroeconomics, some of those. Um, we have 
few students that take those, but um, still trying to get some, that, that's where the student interest lies, and having them be able to earn some, possibly earn some college credit those is, is great as well. We can, we can certainly include the AP by building in the board update next week. <coughs> Next on our agenda is the MSBA August Board Report. <coughs> Hello everyone and welcome to the Missouri School Boards Association's Board Report for the month of August. We thank you for the opportunity to share some news and information during a few minutes of your board meeting. We begin with a look at a new law that expands virtual learning options for students throughout Missouri. Under the law, school districts must allow students to take virtual courses offered by the district or by a vendor approved by the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. <coughs> students may take virtual courses even if the course is already offered by the school district. The school district must give credit to the student for taking the course and pay for the course but the district can collect state aid on the student enrolled in a virtual course. A student would be allowed to take all of his or her courses virtually up to what would be equivalent to full-time attendance. MSBA Associate Executive Director Kelly Hopkins says the way students enroll in virtual courses must be consistent with the way they enroll in courses offered in the district. So we can't have a special vetting process for students who want to take virtual courses. Instead, the law establishes a standard, kind of like a court case. The standard is st students may take a virtual course at the district's expense if they're a resident unless the school district can show that it is not in the best interest of the student to do so. If the district denies a student the ability to take a virtual course, the student may appeal to the Board of Education and ultimately to the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. Hopkins says, despite some concerns with the law, virtual education has the potential to benefit students. Virtual education has the, um, an opportunity to do amazing things, to enhance and supplement the education we provide children in our school districts. It really does. And uh, I, I think if districts really do everything the law allows them to do in terms of monitoring and in terms of making decisions about students and virtual courses, it could, be, it could turn out to be a good thing. The virtual course law and many others become effective August 28th, but officials with the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education tell us it will be following the existing rules for students interested in taking virtual courses for at least the first semester of this school year. A summary of all the legislation approved by the General Assembly and signed into law this year is posted on the MSBA website and the MSBA Action Center site. Registration is now open for the 2018 MSBA Annual Conference to be held September 27th through the 30th at the Lake of the Ozarks. Here's a look at this year's conference. I'm Mike Front, MSBA President. I'm Rhonda Gilstrap, MSBA President-Elect. And I'm Melissa Randall, MSBA Executive Director. <coughs> now more than ever, we need strong board members advocating for all public schools and students in Missouri. Professional development is critical to becoming an effective school leader. The 2018 MSBA Annual Conference provides so many of these essential opportunities. There is valuable knowledge for board members of all levels. Whether you've just been elected and you're still fulfilling CBN requirements, or you're an experienced board member representing your district as a delegate, this is your chance to get so much of the essential information you need. The general sessions feature nationally recognized speakers that inspire and educate. There are over 100 concurrent sessions to attend designed for your continuing education. Of course, none of us can do it alone. Engage with leadership teams from other districts. Visit the trade show and membership reception. This is your chance to network with other board members and learn from each other. And let's not forget the reason we do all of this, the students. 
See some of the best and the brightest that Missouri has to offer at MSBA Student Showcase of Public School Program. The MSBA Annual Conference is the largest gathering of education leaders in the state. We need you there, so don't miss out. This is your chance to get so much critical information over the course of just a few short days. Public schools are consistently faced with new challenges. The promise from MSBA is to develop leaders and be your trusted resource so we can rise to face these challenges on behalf of all of Missouri's children. Please take the next step, register now, and attend the 2018 MSBA Annual Conference. Also, be sure your school board is represented at the MSBA Fall Delegate Assembly to be held on Friday, September 28th during the annual conference. This delegate assembly will be considering approval of MSBA's advocacy positions document and will form the basis of MSBA's lobbying efforts during the 2019 session of the Missouri General Assembly. Delegates do not have to be registered for the annual conference in order to participate in the delegate assembly and if your board's designated delegate cannot attend, you can send another board member to represent your board at this important meeting. As students, teachers, and staff are returning to begin a new school year this month, MSBA Center for Education Safety reminds school administrators it's a good time to review and revise your district's emergency operations plan. That document is the big picture plan for all responses to natural, accidental, and man-made emergencies, including weather, violent incidents, and other events that may not start on the school grounds, but could have an impact on the school day. Be sure to contact MSBA Center for Education Safety if you have any questions on emergency operation plans and other issues related to school safety. That's it for this month's edition of the MSBA Board Report. Thanks for allowing us to have some time at your board meeting, and so long from Columbia. Great, thank you. Um, board, next on our agenda is motion to approve the purchases over $7,500 as presented. So moved. Motion made by Mrs. Walker, second by Mrs. Lang. Discussion? By roll call. Mr. Lane? Aye. 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 Motion carries 6-0. Next on our agenda, under fiscal responsibility still, uh, board I'll entertain a motion to approve the July 2018 financial statements as presented. So moved. Second. Motion made by Mrs. Walker, second by Mr. Lang. <laughs> Mr. Sobel. Thank you, Mrs. Cope. Uh, of course, we're just uh, looking at July, so the first month of the fiscal year, not a lot to talk about. But I did want to share some information just because I've had some questions recently about fund balances and how that works. Uh, so the very first slide here is just the information that was presented to the board. This is our June 30th data. And what I would point out here is that uh, as, we, as we look at that, I guess my pointer's not going to show up all that well. Uh, but if you see the actual results for uh, 2017 and the actual results for 2018 fiscal years, uh, you, you can see that our, our fund balance uh, you know, has increased in proportion to uh, the difference between revenue and expense. But really what I want to point out is, as we go to the next slide, thank you, so if you look now at the end of July, our fund balance number is a little bit different than what we showed on the previous slide. And that's really because when we started at $44 million, uh, in July of this year, uh, we took in less revenue than we spent. So in July, we uh, spent a $1.3 million more than we collected in revenue. And if you take a look at July last year, we actually had uh, $355,000 of revenue that was in, in, in excess of the expense. So those change a little bit. So our fund balance at the, at the end of July is different. But that doesn't mean that there's no rhyme or reason or methodology behind the changes in fund balance. It's directly related to what we bring in and what we spend in any given month. So that number is going to change month to month, but it's an accurate reflection of the transactions that occurred 
in that particular month. And then uh, on our last slide, uh, I just wanted to show you, uh, this is information that I shared with the board when we did the budget workshop in May, uh, but this is based on uh, data from the uh, annual secretary of the board report. This is 2016-17. Uh, you'll see the next agenda item is approving this year's report for Francis Howell. So 1718 data uh, universally is not available yet. Uh, but in 2016-17, uh, you can see that our fund balance in comparison to our uh, benchmarking districts um, is towards the lower part of, uh, of that rank of districts. So a number of districts, uh, both uh, in St. Charles uh, uh, County and uh, outside, <coughs> that have uh, carry fund balances uh, significantly larger uh, than what we have at Francis Howe. So just because I fielded some questions recently about fund balance, I thought I would take a moment tonight just to share that information with you. Thank you, Mr. Sommel. Board, any questions? Okay. Bye, roll call. Mr. Lane. Aye. 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 Motion carries seven zero. Board, I entertain a motion to approve the 2017-2018 annual Secretary of the Board <coughs> report as presented. So Second. Motion made by Mrs. Lang, seconded by Mrs. Walker. Board, any questions? I roll call. Ms. Stiglitz? Aye. 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 Motion carries seven zero. Board, I'll entertain a motion to approve the additional non-certified positions and revise FISPA salary schedule as presented. So moved. Second. Motion made by Mr. Haynes, second by Mrs. Walker. Mrs. Simpkins, thank you, Mrs. Cope. We had a, a thorough work session last month regarding the needs uh, for these positions. Um, but I wanted just to point out a few changes as we worked through the logistics of the position that were a little bit different from our workshop. So you'll see that um, by increasing the position, the ESC position at Daniel Boone, that left us a half-time ESC vacancy at the Early Childhood Central School Road facility. And so our, our recommendation is to add a .5 FTE to that position, making that a full-time position. It will not have an impact on our salary budget as those positions um, in the early childhood centers are paid for by the special education grant. So just wanted to point that out a little bit different from our conversation. As well as, um, as we talked about the logistics of this position, um, we do have a current paraprofessional on our Inspire team um, who will be tasked with training and supporting this new position. And we'll have some specialized training and the strategies that these folks will utilize when working with our students. Um, and so we felt it was best to move that position over to the pay grade on the fees for salary schedule that would provide the same compensation, um, as well as a couple of additional steps for that person because of the increased additional responsibilities that that person will have in training and supporting the group. So again, just a little bit different. Um, we are excited for these positions. We feel that um, we know the emotional and social needs of our students is growing and this is a way that we can directly affect those students each and every day uh, with this additional support. Thank you, Ms. Board, any questions? Mr. Lee? Um, I've expressed this with some of the administrative body already. I have concerns, not with this plan. I mean, many people have voiced their concerns and the needs that we have in the bill. But I have concerns of the rigor and expectations on our early childhood, kindergarten, and first grade students. I just think it's a little bit out of hand and we need to review that. They just need time to play and create. I think we've gone to the breadth of knowledge, which is wonderful. They have all these facts. But I mean, we're reacting to a need, but I think we need to be proactive in looking at and speaking to those teachers not a small core group, but all those teachers as to the expectations on those small children. Yes. 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 Yes.
concerns with these positions. Okay. I roll call. Mr. Hain? Aye. 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 Motion carries 7-0. Board next on our agenda is Superintendent Comments. Dr. Mary Hendrick Service. I want to start by saying that school got off to a really smooth start. As a matter of fact, as I was visiting the buildings this week, a lot of people are saying like it almost is too good of a start. We're just holding our breath and writing it out. So um, the students were thrilled to be back. Our parents were thrilled that they were back. Uh, facilities were in excellent shape, and I can tell you that our staff was very excited to have, have the kids back on the first day. Um, we learned this month that France Hall has been named by Niche as the number one best district in St. Charles County and number 13 in Missouri. The ranking is three spots higher than last year and puts Francis Hall in the top 3% of the state. Francis Hall high schools were all in the top 50 high schools in Missouri and Francis Hall had four of the top five middle schools and the top seven elementary schools in St. Charles County. We also learned on Tuesday that our district teacher of the year, Shelby Parks, who had advanced to the regional teacher of the year, was selected by the committee to be one of only seven state finalists. Shelby's an outstanding teacher who has great relationships with her colleagues and students. We're, part of her, we're proud of her work, and we wish her well in the next steps to be the Missouri Teacher of the Year. Frances Howell High School Marketing Teacher and Deck Advisor Larry Anders has been named to the 2018, has been named the 2018 Marketing Educator of the Year by the Missouri Marketing and Cooperative Education Association. The honor recognizes his significant contributions to quality programming that has resulted in high student achievement in marketing and cooperative education. Uh, 266 students, the most in district history, have been named to the AP Scholars for 1718. In order to earn this distinction, students must have completed three AP courses and scored a three-year advance on the coursework. As Nathan noted earlier, AP is one measure. Our students are college and career ready. Three of our young scientists, and I'm about to butcher some names here, Risha Mishra, Rishi Mishra from Francis Hall Central, David Yang from Francis Hall High School, and Shiha Anem from Francis Hall North successfully completed the Students and Teachers as Research Scientists program over the summer at Unsel. And we want to thank Michelle Walker for pursuing and writing a $5,000 grant that has been awarded for diversity work to be done at Francis Hall North. Um, and then last but not least, I just want to share that the board lip sync video from Kick Off, Kick Off reached 11,000 people on the district Facebook page and has over 2,500 views. Uh, I also would like to share that at a meeting with superintendents last week that it appears that uh, other boards are going to jump on the challenge and we could be expecting to see some <laughs> fine lip syncing from your fellow board members in some surrounding districts. Very good, thank you very much. Um, amazing achievements already uh, being recognized in our district. We're very excited about that. Board. Uh, it's time for our comments. Anyone have board comments this evening? Mrs. Stiglitz. <laughs> um, first of all, I, would, I, I know they've already left, but I would really like to thank the Ambulance District for donating that AED. As you guys all know, AEDs are really important to my heart uh, because, and no pun intended, <laughs> and <laughs> because um, I was a coronary care nurse and an ICU nurse before I became a school nurse, and I know how much they can save lives. I don't know if all of you are aware, I know that some of you are, but Francis Hall School District was the first district in the state of Missouri to have AEDs in all their buildings, and that was due to a grant written by uh, one of the school nurses and uh, got it. So I'm very, very proud of that fact. So please make sure that they know how much we appreciate that. That's an amazing thing. I know how to deliver that message. I figured you did. Any other comments, board? Mr. White. Um, a year ago, we were asked to do buddy schools, and I had three buddy schools last year. This year, I have four. I'd like to congratulate all four of them. I had the opportunity to attend Becky David's Before School Bash, uh, ECE, ECE Hackman's Open House, and ECE Central's Open House, and then Daniel Boone's Open House. And they were all well attended and well organized. I was very impressed with the staff. Uh, also the parents and students. So congratulations to those four buildings and their initial meetings with their families. Thank I thought you. as you started, you were congratulating them that they got you as a lot. <laughs> yes, they are. <laughs> <laughs> I thought the results were headed. Mr. Hay. And just, I, I know we're just kicking off the year, so everybody will start getting into a groove, but 
I know Francis Hot Central and Francis Hot North, they have their kickoffs, like for their sports programs and stuff tomorrow evening, and Francis Hot North has theirs on Saturday afternoon. So get out and support these kids. I think you're going to have all the programs going to be represented, including bands. So get out and support these kids. They put a lot of time and effort into this. So it's nice to perform in front of a full stand as opposed to performing just from a few people. So keep, keep track of the websites, and you know they're always posted out there. Our activity directors do a great job of posting this information and all the calendars. So keep an active, I, I, you know, active on those and get out and support these kids whenever we can. Great, thank you. Board, next on the agenda is Board of Education requests. Are there any topics that you have a request on currently? If we could take a look at our upcoming meetings, our September 20th meeting, if anything needs to be added, removed, changed. <coughs> So I think we're going to be okay. Okay, cool. that'll be the first time that we'll start to report out on our strategic goals. Very exciting. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any adjustments? Okay. Board, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn our meeting. So moved. Motion made by Mrs. Walker, seconded by Mrs. Lang, by roll call. Ms. Walker. Aye. 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 A